Welcome to episode 23 of Lift As We Rise. I am Roshni Gadger. We've had a bit of a break from our podcast for the last two months. I've been focusing on streamlining Stratistude Consulting Service Stream to better enable strategy to execution for our clients. We've got an added focus on high performance coaching and resilience coaching. An exciting development has been the launch of our Future Ones NPC, and Future Ones focuses on educational STEM. So please go out to www.stratistute.co.za and you can check out all the details. And on the topic of educational STEM, you'll understand in this conversation why it is quite appropriate that we're talking about it today. So in episode 21, we unpacked ESG and what it means to consumer behavior in South Africa. Since then, I'm pleased to say that the Advertising Regulatory Board has embarked on its responsible advertising strategy. So kudos to the team over there and we'll claim some influence on that. Today, we turn our attention to the Just Transition Framework as it relates to the automotive sector. In South Africa, the automotive sector is a leading contributor to manufacturing and also a key employer. In 2020, the sector contributed 4.9% to GDP. 2020 wasn't a great performance year compared to 2019 when it contributed 6.4%. Interesting to note that about 64% of locally manufactured vehicles are destined for export markets, mostly in the EU. So the presidential Climate Change Commission's Just Transition Framework identifies the automotive sector as one of four at risk during this transition process, the others being coal, agriculture and tourism. As a country, of course, we have no choice but to adapt. So how are things progressing? Now, a company in South Africa has been leading the way in the EV revolution since 2009, helping OEMs, property owners and fuel companies to adapt to e-mobility. I have the pleasure today of talking to Winston Yordan, CEO and founder of Grid Cars. Winston, thank you so much for making time and for speaking to our listeners today. Thank you so much. A pleasure is all mine. All of mine. Yeah, sorry. No worries, Winston. I think I shared with you that in preparing this conversation, it's been in the pipeline since August already. I was hoping to have NAMSA leadership join the conversation today to speak to us about the systemic um, enablers, but we'll park that conversation for now. I, I'm afraid I haven't yet received a reply from, from the CEO's office. So today, let's speak about what's practically happening on the ground in this space. Let's start with you, your vision. Take us back to 2009. I mean, what fueled your strategic investment in this space? And fast forward to now, what solutions is Grid Cars providing? You know, I've, I've always looked forward as to where things are going. Um, you know, at the early 2000s, I spent some time um, promoting flying car technology and hovercrafts and all sorts of weird different things. And, and that really made me look into, you know, are these things practical? What's going to go forward? Where is it going to go? And things that just kept popping up on my radar was the, around the electrification and electric technology, electric vehicles. And I started reading a lot around it. And probably around about 2004, I pretty much made up my mind that a big part of my future was going to be around electric vehicles. Um, certainly for the next 10 years, I, I tried to actually design and build electric cars. So I spent a lot of time understanding the hardcore part of the technology. In other words, what are the things that restrain the build? And, and in those days, it really was a big problem for battery technology. Charging infrastructure was non-existent. You know, so all of those sort of things. And as we dug deeper and deeper, we realized that most likely the OEMs are going to participate in the space eventually. Remember, this was the early 2000s. Um, and that we wouldn't necessarily be able to compete with them. It'll be a very difficult competition because you really need a lot of money if you want to develop vehicles, you know, to, to go through the entire production and design cycles. So we started looking very carefully at what niches would suit us. So from about 2005, 2006, 
we really had put our focus still building cars on the side, but really looking to understand the core technology, the vehicle management systems, the energy management systems, the battery technology, um, all of the things that would be the supporting technology of this. That crystallized in run by 2012 into really focusing on the charging side of that, whether that means the the back office and the billing systems and the management systems and the maintenance and all of that infrastructure that sits invisible to the customer, where you know, but that is essentially the thing that makes it that it's so easy for you to walk, tap a card, charge, and you're gone and you're done. Um, that became the focus for us and the deployment of that network. And we started to work with the OEMs and that really solidified that as a strategy for us. And as our investors came on board, we were able to then step into that space and really drive the, the, the entire agenda around putting the technology down, building solid platforms, ensuring those platforms are open, that everybody can work with them, that they work with international standards and that and at the same time that it's open enough for all OEMs, all of the manufacturers of our vehicles to be able to use that same infrastructure, that we don't go and build silos of infrastructure. Winston, 2009 was a very different era and we had different priorities just post the 2008 crisis. Uh, what gave you the courage to venture into the space or what pulled you? Sure, maybe ignorance. <laughs> you know, looking back today on the on the route we took, maybe I would say, oh, don't go that way. You know, but no, I, I really, I really believed in where this technology was going. You know, as as I looked into it with a background in physics, you know, it it became really evident to me that this is the right technology. It's going to be cheaper. It's going to be more flexible. It's going to be cleaner. It's going to have all of the elements that would drive that going forward. So in spite of the fact that, yes, we were just starting with load shedding in those years, um, you know, and we, but at the same time, I could really see where this technology would go. It, it may not have been obvious to um, the general, let's, I, I don't think, the, I think some customers, absolutely, I know people who were, building electric cars in that time already or trying to. Um, you know, maybe industry hadn't shifted enough. Government certainly hadn't shifted enough. But for us, it just became obvious and we felt we had to sort of pioneer that space and and open up the opportunities, um, maybe put some thought leadership and training into that. You know, I already by that time, I had already started developing um, educational programs around STEM, as you stated earlier, and that is, and those were... You know, things like the, the Solar Challenge, it was called the South African Solar Challenge eventually. You might know today as the Sassel Solar Challenge. So that actually came out of this project where it became, this was the obvious way to, to talk about it because now we had students building cars and competing and they were in the public space. They could show the public what the technology was about. It gave education strategies into the universities and the schools that they could also see, wow, this is, this is how it's going to work. We can actually do this. We can physically get down and build a car and, and go and race this car on the roads. So I think that really, it gave us stepping stones where we could see small successes. So we could see strong South African solar car teams coming out. And that to me gave me a lot of belief that, wow, we could actually develop technology in this country. We could actually grow these things. This is where it has to go. And I think those little steps allow you to keep going in spite of the fact that you're maybe 10 years away from you know, from a, a a business that would seem obvious to the rest of the of the world. Winston, thanks for sharing that. It's always interesting to hear what fuels an entrepreneur's vision and gives them the courage to take that leap of faith, which it was for you, I guess, at the time. So if we talk about green mobility, there are a couple of terms that are used sometimes interchangeably, but to the average non-engineer, it can get quite complicated. So we talk about new energy vehicles, EVs, BEVs, hydrogen fuel cells, or e-mobility. Can you unpack these terms for us? Sure. So, so an NEV, new energy vehicles, um, is a generic encapsulating term to encapsulate 
all of the new technology and the advancements in technology. So with um, new energy vehicles, we even include efficient petrol vehicles or efficient diesel vehicles. We certainly include hybrids and um, electric vehicles. And as you said, the gas type systems and of those gases can be LPG, natural gas, um, hydrogen gas. So all of these technologies um, sort of are clustered under that. You know, as as a maybe I'm gonna say individually as Winston, but probably very much as the vision as grid cars, we do believe that 95% of that industry really is electric. So so the new energy vehicles will predominantly be electric vehicles. They would always be the the other technologies are going to be accommodated, and the, there'll be specialist areas where they can be used. So you may find, for example, that in a in a mining space where they might have excess hydrogen coming off as a waste product from some of their internal processes, they could use that hydrogen to power hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, and it then becomes the cheapest fuel for them. So so we would always see these these things on the side. We see it today where gas vehicles are used in warehouses because they have slightly lower emissions but they still have emissions. So you, you'll see a big move towards electric again. So I think all of these technologies come in under that. The, the, there's the big separation for me really comes down to whether you're running with an electric motor or with some sort of combustion motor. Because some of the, because if you're talking about hybrids and you're talking about gas vehicles, gas vehicles are, are still using a combustion type process. So they're still burning something. And once you're doing that, your efficiencies come down quite a lot. And certainly in many of the cases, you still have fairly you know, emissions. They may not be as bad as burning petrol, but they certainly are emissions. And whereas once you move towards electric, you now control that process 100% because typically at the point of use, you've got no emissions at all. Once you look backwards in the value chain and start to understand how we're going to be powering these systems, then you've got to be, you've got to manage that and understand where that energy is coming from. You know, we'd often have people say, but electric vehicles are still powered by coal because it comes from a coal burning power station. Well, once you look into that properly and you do all of the, look at all the science, look at all the numbers, and you're going to see that, yes, that's true, but an electric vehicle would still be three times cleaner than the equivalent petrol vehicle driving on, on coal. So uh, so I think you, you still have to understand that there, is a, there are better processes out there and we are working with those. But certainly there are niche applications for the other new energy vehicle technologies, hydrogen, et cetera. We will see those coming through. Thanks for explaining that in understandable terms, Winston, because I think it's important. Sometimes it gets so complex and technical that that in itself is a deterrent to even thinking about a new way of, of mobility. So let's get into that. What does NEV mean for the evolution of transport and mobility as we know it in a country like South Africa? Paint a scenario for us or some scenarios. So I think there's a couple of things. You know, if you look at um, something like the amount of fossil fuel that we import into this country, I think at last count it's sort of 400 billion a year that that goes into into the fossil fuel space. What happens in moving towards new electric vehicles? Firstly, we're more efficient on the use of those fuels, so that really becomes important. If you look at any of the hybrid technologies, they're out there simply because the, they use an electric motor. To, to deal with the inefficient portion of the drive cycle that would have been used in a petrol motor. And that brings your average consumption considerably down, you know, somewhere between 30 and 70% lower. So it really makes an impact on the efficiency of using these fossil fuels. And remember, those fossil fuels are not only polluting our environment, but they're very expensive. And over and above the fact that they're expensive, they're, they're an economic um, handcuff. So we're sitting with um, a external countries that are manufacturing these fuels or pulling these things out of the ground, and they can determine that price. So literally with no, with no ill doing on our side in South Africa, somewhere in the world, something can happen. You know, let's say a war in between Russia and Ukraine. And, and, that, and that impact will immediately have an economic impact to South Africa even though we're not at all involved in where it's happening. So we could be put into recession as a country because of someone else's politics in terms of the price of fuel. 
So it's a really, economically, it's not a good thing. If we're moving towards electric, that control comes into our own hands. We can produce our own electricity. Now, I know many people would look and say, ask them, well, are they producing enough electricity? So, And, and I think the, the idea is that, yes, there are things that we have to be fixed at Eskom, and we've got to sort those out, and we will sort those out. But at the end of the day, making electricity, I can make it at home. I can put up solar panels, and I can make my own electricity for my, for my vehicle. So it means we bring a lot of economic stability into the country because we don't have this big um, – foreign investment or foreign amount of money that could literally vary over minutes. <laughs> you know, somebody could change the price and now we're in trouble financially. So I think it brings a lot of that. Lower energy costs, more flexibility and energy independence. Those are the things that electrification would bring to the, to the economy. Winston, the scenario you've painted makes me realize the importance of time in any transition process. We're experiencing exactly what you've painted out now in terms of reliance on other countries for, for various um, commodities, et cetera, and how that hamstrings progress. And how do we become more self-efficient, sufficient? And, you know, with any type of transition, innovation strategy, yes, it's daunting, and one can't quite see the future yet, but the opportunities to think creatively, to innovate, to go into a different direction is something that we're trying to um, position to entrepreneurs listening in today. So I'm keen to, to hear more thoughts on that. So looking at transition plans then, the global sales for NEVs in 2020 actually accelerated, rising by 43% to about 3.24 million units, mostly sold in Europe. Now, as we said earlier, what happens in Europe matters because three out of four cars destined for export markets from South Africa go to the EU. From a retail lens, by 2038, they're projecting that the sale of EV cars will overtake ICE vehicle sales. Europe's planning to go ICE sales of about 40% by 2030. And within 10 years, by 2040, they want to up that to 80%. Now, I had a look at what's happening in the South African market. And it looks like from a plug-in hybrid point of view, we've got about 79 vehicles on the road. This was in 2020. Traditional hybrid, 153. And electric at 92. So we're not there yet, and the numbers don't seem big, but I think transition means we've got until 2035 and then until 2050 to get there. Winston, what is being done to help vehicle owners in South Africa ensure that this big change is practical, efficient, and most important, affordable to everyone? So, so I'd like to first just make one correction. The numbers that you quoted are probably more around the 2015 numbers, if I think okay. about where they stand. So the reason why I know that is that um, only Nissan was in the market at that time. They only sold 92 vehicles. And by 2015, 2016, BMW came in and they were selling a lot more than that. So where the numbers that really stand today, and I'll just give you the two big numbers. So there's about, a th there's about 1,400 electric vehicles in the market in South Africa. And there's probably that, that or more. So let's say between one and a half and 2,000 hybrid vehicles. So we're sitting with a fleet of close to 4,000 plug-in type vehicles if you look across the board at all of the different definitions of, um, of electrification. So I think absolutely the market is growing. We are seeing, um, for example, this year alone, up to, to date, like as in to about a week ago, we'd sold just shy of 400 vehicles this year uh, of electric vehicles. So just shy of 400 electric vehicles this year. I know one manufacturer, just a single OEM, that is saying they will sell 600 vehicles next year. So if you take that and you multiply that out, it means we're looking at a good 1,000 to 2,000 vehicles next year, which means the electric vehicle fleet would more than double in, in size in the next 12 months. So, so this, this shows the rapid adoption, which is that hockey stick of growth that we will see rapid adoption. As we see that, the demands for these transitional technologies becomes incredibly important. So, you know, as I said earlier, we have to solve the challenges faced by Eskom. Those have to get done. 
Secondly, we've got to start looking at taking a level of control ourselves and putting up solar at your home, understanding solar technology, supporting renewable technology. So finding ways to look for your business that says, even if we can't put solar here, we could wheel solar from a solar site and and really be driven to say we want renewable energy at our site. Um, We can start looking at putting charging infrastructure down. Now, certainly that's one of Greg Cars' core businesses at this stage is rolling out infrastructure. But finding sites to put um, infrastructure down is critically important. Finding companies that are open to, um, let's say, investing in their own network. So if you're a company that has got 20 head off- or 20 offices across the country, Make a commitment to putting charges down at your offices. Again, this is the sort of thing that we as grid cars would be absolutely open to helping. So to helping you to establish those networks, manage those networks, exposing those networks into the customers. And if I say that, that means there's opportunities for IT technology around mapping. There's an understanding of that back-end system, those billing systems and how they how they come together and how they work because they are going to be different to the traditional systems. You know, we had a discussion today with somebody saying, what about credit cards? You know, credit cards will be part of it, but these are new technologies. Why do you even need a credit card? You plug your car in, your car knows who it is. The car says to the charger, hi, I'm Winston's car, build his account, please. And, you know, these are the sort of technologies that we should be looking at is how do we advance how this will work, that we don't try to build technology on Certainly, at some point, you do build technology on existing infrastructure, but you don't want the infrastructure to dictate how you do things if you can do them better. So we want to see a technological evolution. We want to see people looking and saying, oh, that's how it works. We can do it differently or we can do it better and we can improve on that. I think there's a big need for general education of people at all levels, whether that's just the public in general, whether it's at schools, um, et cetera. You know, I'm blown away sometimes where I go and speak to schools and, you know, you'll see kids and they just look and they say, yeah, but, you know, why aren't we moving electric? It's so obvious to them because they're not constrained by previous thinking. They're not already driving a fossil fuel vehicle. And because the fossil fuel vehicle goes vroom, you think that vroom means it can go fast. You know, they don't have that that connection in their brain. Their brain just looks and says, oh, it's electric. It's much quicker than fossil fuel. This is where it's going to go. We've got to see more products coming into the market. So, And that meaning vehicle products, um, you know, and that at different pricing levels. Because right now it is the higher priced vehicles. I always say it's not the expensive cars. It's the higher priced cars. Because the electric vehicles at that level are at the same level as the petrol vehicle at that level. You know, so um, I was speaking to a friend and he said, yeah, but he can't afford an iX3, which is the BMW um, electric version. So I said to him, oh, can you afford an X3, which is the petrol version? And he said, no. I said, well, then not no point in discussing it because it's that level of vehicle. But we are going to see this moving down in that vehicle, um, the let's call it the the value thing. So we are going to see sub 500,000 vehicles coming into the market that will be fully electric. Um, So I think over the next year, this will be the time where the broadness of products is going to become exciting. And and certainly that more and more it's going to become obvious that this is the future and and we need to support that. So Winston, I, like you, grew up in the third industrial revolution and vroom most certainly means it goes fast, particularly if it's red, I guess. And I love driving. So to me, a road trip is an absolute pleasure provided one has the time. Take us through the new journey. So I am trading in my internal combustion vehicle to an EV, and I'm taking a trip from where I am in Port Elizabeth, Quebec, up to Cape Town. Take me through that journey. What, what will it look like? What will it feel like? Yeah, so firstly, congratulations on making that decision because that puts you in in the 1,400 people that now drive electric vehicles in this country. Um, you know, the first thing that's going to happen is that the, the at the dealership, they will have a discussion with you that will just explain some of the basics in difference, you know, that you no longer need to go and find a petrol station once a week because every morning when you wake up, your car will be full. So what they will do is they will give you they will give you a charging unit that you can install at your home. And that charger, when you get home, you plug it in. And literally every morning when I get up, my car is full. And that means that 
this, the planning is a very different type of planning because you're not like a fuel car. You're, you're, you're looking at filling it and then watching it drop, 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 and then you've got to make a decision to do something. With this case, you're pretty much full all the time. The only time you've got to think about when you have to refill your car regularly is on a long trip, as you correctly said. And with that, there are charges on all the major highways. So the N1, the N2, the N3, the N4, consider those the major highways. They've got um, charges every maximum distance every 200 kilometers, but on many of those roads, every 100 kilometers or less. So if you look at things like the garden route, there we're down to almost 50 kilometers between charges or some of them. So you really actually have a choice now. You're not constrained. On the main N1, you might ha have to stop at Beaufort West and you have to stop at Lanesburg because that's where the charges are. Whereas we're going to see more and more now that you will have choices. You'll be able to look and say, I can stop here, I can stop there. The charge session takes a little bit longer. So that, so we're going to see a different, a, a different um, approach for the site. So the site doesn't have to be a, it's a filling station. I'm in, I'm going to the bathroom, I'm filling up and I'm gone. There can be a more of a sit down, relax, enjoy yourself. You're going to be here for an hour and, and work through that process that you understand that. It really doesn't, you know, some people say, oh, but if you've got to charge, spend an hour charging, that's going to kill huge amounts of time in my life. You know, I've done five road trips to Cape Town in the last 12 months. And, you know, all of those road trips to Cape Town might, it might have added an extra three or four hours to each of those trips. That's 20 hours of my life. And for the last year, I've been driving electric cars, and that has added hundreds of hours to my life in that the car is so much easier to drive. You've got to get used to the acceleration because the acceleration is immediate. So that's something you've got to, you've got to manage because, you know, you don't just, you know, in a petrol car, you can tramp it flat and then you wait, count to five, and maybe the, pet, the, the power starts picking up. If you do that in an electric car, you're going to light up the wheels and be gone because the, the, the power delivery to the wheels is instantaneous. So getting used to that means that, you know, pulling away is never a problem anymore. Overtaking is trivial. You've always got the power to overtake a vehicle. So you've got to manage that side of it, not, not become overly confident, you know, about how quick the car is on the, at, at the pull away. So, um, but yeah, absolutely the difference would be a little bit more time in between your, your, your charging sessions where you're going to charge. Some of the newer vehicles um, with Mercedes, they've got the, the um, EQS that's out now. And that EQS has got a um, rated range of 700 kilometers. So in theory, one stop to Cape Town. Let's be real, maybe two stops to Cape Town. I don't know anybody who can get to Cape Town with only two stops. You know, generally you're, you're generally you're going to be stopping every two or three hours to stretch your legs, have something to eat, go to the bathroom, and this does mean that you can now make those smaller stops. And probably so with with a car that's got a range of seven hundred kilometers, you can have three stops in between that trip, and in each one just charge for fifteen minutes, and that's a forty five minute charge that you've displaced immediately. So strategically, I think you've got to just think a little bit different. But what's really important is that the cars are high-tech computer cars. These, this is the new technology. The cars will help you. They will tell you where to stop. They will tell you even how long to stop. They will tell you where the next charging station is. They'll tell you what amenities are at that site. So you could look and see, oh, wait a minute, that stop has got a Seattle coffee, whereas this one's got a Wimpy, and you can trade off which one you, you, is more important to you. So you could see, because all of this information is fed to you through the vehicles. So the experience will be a much richer experience, um, and I can promise you a lot more fun. Winston, as I'm listening to you, I'm kind of visualizing my standard trip here to down the coast or, or up to Johannesburg. And I'm one of those people who wants to get there as quickly as possible because I've got stuff to do. But this almost unlocks the concept of a journey. You think back to, you know, when we were younger and we traveled with our parents, there were times where you stopped on the roadside and had a picnic, etc. And I'm wondering, I mean, we, we spoke earlier about one of the other sectors at risk in this trans just transition is tourism. So what is your travel time and those extra stops you have to make now to top up, what does that mean to the tourism industry and tourism market? So now we're looking at the integration or the synergies between vehicle technology evolution and new ways of thinking about tourism. Absolutely. What are your thoughts you know, on that? I mean, 
I can just give you two simple examples, and I named the two towns earlier because they, they, they're sort of our most remote charges, which is Beaufort West and Lanesburg. And because I now, when I stop in Lanesburg, every time I go down, or I've got a, I've got a 45 minutes or an hour, or maybe an hour and a half, depending on which vehicle I'm driving, and depending whether I stopped at the previous stop or whether now I'm really empty and I've got a fully charge. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't know, but Lanesburg is a great car museum. And I discovered this by just sitting there and saying, well, I've got a bit of time. And I quickly looked and I found, oh, here we go. Here's a car museum. It's 10 minutes walk. So I took a walk down and spent some time at the museum. You know, in Beaufort West, there's a huge dam fairly close to where the filling station is. And you can take a walk around. And, you know, suddenly I've discovered things around these stops. And those are, let's call them unusual sites. They were places where you would typically throw in petrol and leave. But I mean, look at the other opportunities in that some charges are at malls and you get to walk around and experience where those are. We're going to see more and more of these sites catering to that tourist or to that person. In other words, they're going to get better quality places to, to dine and to do things. They're going to start to look at how can we attract um, one of the filling stations along the routes that we've seen, you know, have got a have got animals on the side. There's one that's got a lion park, you know, or, or lion breeding. So you could now start to explore and go and actually spend some time with these things and do that. So I think we'll see the sites starting to cater to that and rather becoming hubs where people stop, spend a bit of time and then move on. The one thing I do want to say though is I did one of those trips um, completely on my own and I needed to get down to Port Elizabeth in, on the first day. So I didn't, I wasn't stopping over anywhere. So it was a longish trip for me. I left early in the morning and arrived, arrived in the evening. But I can tell you, I've never felt quite as rested when I got there. I never felt tired during the trip, even though I did the full trip on all of the driving on my own. And it's because I had these breaks in between where, where I, I had a proper body break. I could walk around, I could spend some time and get back into the car and then drive again for two hours. So, so based on that, I really feel that I was better rested and I was a safer driver because I never once in the trip felt, wow, I'm really feeling it now. Whereas, you know, the petrol car, if I did that in one shot, I can guarantee you there would have been times where you would have been feeling, wow, you know, I, I, I need a little bit of um, exercise or something. Whereas you don't get that because of the electric um, style of driving. And it doesn't, it doesn't really change the amount of time radically. And I'll, I'll give you an example. The the guy, there was a journalist that did a trip with a, a BMW vehicle and he did the trip in 21 hours, whereas that's expected to be about a 16 hour trip, maybe a you know 17 hour trip if you drive Johannesburg to Cape Town. And so literally only an extra four hours, that's an extra 25% of the time. And, you know, for I think all the benefits that you get, the pleasure of driving electric vehicles, the lower priced fuel cost, the, you know, the safer driving things, all of those things way outweigh that extra, that extra 20% or 25% in time. Well, your laptop is a mobile office, right? So you can certainly Absolutely. plug in and play and work from anywhere. So let's maybe unpack what has been happening in the We've talked, spoken about the passenger vehicle market. What about public transport and fleet management? Have you seen any adaptation in those spaces? So definitely, um, you know, I think I think the big difference with the commercial side is that it is immensely obvious because they're always working on total cost to company. You know, electric vehicles with certain people, if you drive more than 100 or 150 k's a day, an electric vehicle is already cheaper than a petrol car because of the amount of saving that you get on your um, on your fuel bill. You know, I, when I switched over to electric, I went from having an 8,000 rand a month petrol bill to having an 800 rand a month electricity bill. So I saved 7,000 rand plus. Now, that is not always obvious to, to normal, commercial, uh, normal passenger car drivers, but to the commercial operators, this is absolutely everything they understand. So they, they're already painting those, um, the paths to success. You know, we're seeing, um, oh, it's been in the media, so, and, and there is people like Golden Arrow down in Cape Town making a huge commitment to electric vehicles and electrification. And that's going to be, you know, the, all I'm seeing every time I speak to them, and let's say six months apart, is I'm seeing a, a faster and faster uh, intended uh, transition. So the first time I spoke this, no, we'll transition over a five to 10 year period. 
The next time, no, it's going to be three or four years. The next time, no, we transition in the first year. You know, this is how we're going to change. So the only thing that's changing is that they're bringing the timeline shorter. You know, even with the commercial operating vehicles, I was talking to one of the big, um, uh, let's call it the commercial suppliers, and they were saying, yeah, 2023, 2024. Well, the first vehicle arrived last week, you know, so so we wait, we are a year and a half ahead. They're tightening those timelines. They were saying 2025, 2026 before we'll see, you know, small pro, um, fleets in South Africa. Now they're saying 2023, 2024, we're going to see the first um, electric fleets in South Africa. So all of these timelines are coming in and we're going to see those te- technology adoption happen faster. That will mean, let's put it out there, and that is, Lower cost of um, on that, whether that gets passed on to the customer is probably going to be another discussion. But at the very least, it's going to mean that those businesses can be more um, more profitable. And more profitable means they employ more people, they put more money into research, they put more money into manufacturing. All of those things become viable within that space. So we will see that pull through to the society. So, And we will see that in the logistics space, in the public transport space, etc. If you think about it, you know, one of our um, sort of big flagship projects in this country was the Gau train. And I mean, that was a move from diesel to electric. It's an electric train, you know, and why did that work? Well, it worked because electric trains are cheaper than diesel trains. trains. They are they're cheaper to run, they're cheaper to acquire, they're easier to support, they're more reliable, Every aspect that you measure a public transport success system, that is successful. So there, you know, I don't know how long Car Train has been in, five years, eight years that we've been doing that now. And it's been a successful project. If you're looking at a transitional technology, you know, we can have other discussions around that. But I think more and more we will we see that. Um, all of our heavy transport, if you look at those big, big mining vehicles that people often see, those the ones that carry 100 tons and they use them for open glass mining, those are all a success because of electric drive. And they've been electric drive for the last 30 years. It's not that they have only knew it now going electric. They've already seen the value of the high power that you get from electric and the easier control that you have over electric motors. So we will absolutely see it. We are talking to lots of the big players in those spaces, whether they be logistics companies, bus companies, and helping them with understanding their, their route to charging. Obviously, that's our strength. Not, not necessarily the vehicles, but it's the, the route to charging. How are you going to be charging? Where are you going to charge? What do you need to bring to the table? Winston, I'm going back to what you said earlier, and I heard it quite clearly about the high torque on these vehicles, and it took my mind to taxis. I'd hate to think what taxis are going to look like now competing against each other with EVs. How has that industry responded to this, if there's been any indication so far at all? You see, again, I think the the first problem is product. We don't have um, electric taxis on the ground in South Africa from our traditional taxi suppliers. So from the, um, you know, the, the likes of Toyota have not got an electric product on the ground yet for the, to- for, for the taxi. So, so you may perceive that the taxi industry says, oh, yeah, but okay, there's no vehicles for us. But there are quite a few products coming into the country now through uh, the alternative manufacturers. So, you know, Chinese manufacturers are bringing. So there are quite a few pilot projects already on the ground. We're, we're aware of um, at least one project that's planning to have about 100 vehicles early next year already. And again, it comes down to that, that operational cost. The electric vehicles are more, slightly more expensive, but they absolutely are cheaper on the operational side. Um, when I said that the vehicles have high torque, yes, they do. They've, they really have high kilowatts, high newton meters. You've got everything you need, which is probably the perfect storm for, um, for a, a taxi race. But at the same time, we've got incredible control over them. So we can change the acceleration curve by just affecting a few parameters in the motor controller, and that, that whole motor control is different. It's not that easy to do that in a petrol engine. In a petrol engine, you've got to have much more complex systems in place. Whereas in electric, it's really just software. You're going to do a couple of software changes and you can absolutely bring that performance right down as low as you want it to be. Um, Also, you can be monitoring those things much more easily. You can see what's going on with that type of technology. So so really, I wouldn't worry about the taxi races. I'd love to see one. I think it's going to be great when the first one happens. But hopefully it's under controlled circumstances at one of our racetracks. 
and we can see you know what that what that real difference is but yes the technology is great it will transition the vehicles we will have some challenges that we'll face around managing that thing but certainly we're going to over the next year or two we will absolutely see electric um, becoming entrenched in every industry um, maybe just a slight aside and that is you know 10 years ago when I started in this um, business and well probably 20 years ago now but but sort of 10 years ago there was a lot of talk about electric vehicles entering into motorsport and the the electric vehicles kept saying to the motorsport people please we want a special category for the electric cars because they're not quite as fast as the petrol cars, etc. Today, it's the other way around. When electric enters motorsport, they immediately dominate. And the petrol drivers are now saying, wait a minute, can't we have a special category so that at least we can win our own category because the electric cars are winning all the races? You know, if you look at big races like Pikes Peak in, in the United States, which is a hill climb race, and, you know, you, you want to finish in the top 10, you'd better arrive at the start line with an electric vehicle. Because otherwise, you're not not competing. Winston, thank you. And the question around taxi is is quite a pertinent one because we assume that we have vehicles, so everyone does, but I think the majority of South Africans don't. So the last thing you want in this type of evolution is to leave people behind because they simply don't have the power to make that choice, right? So let's circle back to the to the business opportunities then. There was a really interesting report that was released a few days ago at the end of October that the world's top automotive manufacturers are planning to invest $1.2 trillion to 2030 to produce EVs along with batteries and related materials. Now that converts to about 54 million battery EVs in 2030. This is a huge investment. I mean, if you think of those numbers, Winston, they almost represent your top tech companies, probably the market cap of someone like Alphabet. Of course, Tesla, VW, Toyota, Ford, Mercedes, GM, they're all in the race and they have a footprint in South Africa. NAMSA reports that in 2020, um, foreign direct investment in the South African sector amounts to 9.2 billion and then a further about 2.4 billion on the component side. Now, I'm so not here to speak to those numbers from an industry side, but speaking to you, Winston, as a South African self-funded entrepreneur, for new and existing people in the value chain, um, what should they be considering in their strategic growth plans? Sure. Um, maybe just to give Namsa um, maybe the, the the smallest excuse, they did last week run what's called Automotive Week, which is the it's the biggest conference that is held on Africa with for the OEM. So I know weeks before that, and certainly for, even for us, last week was massively intense. But what came out of that, and I really challenge you, you know, engage with um, with Namsa. You'll get them now. I think maybe this week they're still taking a, a week off, but from next week you'd certainly get hold of them. Um, and engage with them to bring some of the results of last week's um, thing to this forum. Because there are some incredible discussions that happened last week around where technology is going, what's going to happen in the industry, and what changes they're expecting over the next year. It was really a, an, an amazing uh, conference to be at. So, so certainly a business-to-business -business conference are very much the, the, the leaders in each of those spaces to, to talk around that. Um, so a big part of what we were looking at and how we were exploring with the, the OEMs is certainly how do we fund the, the charging technology going forward and who would those players be? How do we encourage new players into that space? So yes, as grid cars, it has been privately funded, so through the, our shareholders. Um, that doesn't mean that that's how it will always be. I think there will be programs to get better, you know, to to co fund charging infrastructure and support that. But at the end of the day, the charging infrastructure is going to be a commercially driven industry. It's like filling stations. You know, you don't think about, oh, does government have to worry about filling? They'll, they'll pop up when they need it. There's a commercial drive for them. They will, they will get their technology in, in as it's needed. So I think from a... Um, a technological point of view, we, we will absolutely see those changes happen. We will see that um, EV charging and EV infrastructure systems would, would move 
um, would migrate, I think, towards, let's just call it the, the capitalistic side of that industry in the same way that garages are. The interesting things for me are going to be things like, you know, if you look at fuel and the fuel systems, because those will now slowly diminish in terms of their, their functionality and the support for it and all of those things. And it's to look at what those new industries are that are coming through, because I think the new think technologies are going to be around working with renewables, understanding, you know, services are going to be different. Um, the the current stats that we're hearing coming out of um, places like Norway, where they've had a massive adoption, a very aggressive adoption of electric vehicles, they're saying that the typical um, a, a change in services is about 70% drop. So there's 70% less services on vehicles. Now, that doesn't mean these, these because there are now batteries involved in these vehicles and they'll also have their own um, value chain and things that happen. But if you look at the reliability, it means that vehicles are becoming much more reliable. So there's less money being spent on services, which would mean you know, more disposable money to spend in other places in that industry. Uh, that could be a whole different conversation. I'm just thinking about the service centers, who they employ, the the kind of the technical skills they have, and one would need to think about how that gets repurposed, right? Let's turn our focus. Go for it. Uh, sorry, yeah. No, what I was going to say is I know often people would see, oh, but, you know, what about job losses? I don't see it like that. I, I don't believe we lose a single job. I think, but, but what I do believe is that our, the job you're doing today will be different to the job you're doing in five or ten years' time. Now, if that to you translates to I'm um, losing my job, well, then that's fine. But, but at the end of the day, jobs change. So when you're in a job, you shouldn't be thinking that I'll be doing the same job in five years' time because tech, um, society must progress. We've got to advance as a society. So if you see I'll be doing this job now and in five, in five years' time I'll be doing a slightly different job, and yes, this job may no longer exist. So you know, did you really lose your job or did your job just transition? And I like to really believe that most jobs would be preserved in some form, they will just be different. You will be doing different things. Instead of driving a coal truck, you'll be driving a truck using delivering solar panels. You know, and instead of cleaning somebody's windscreen at a at a fuel station, you might be cleaning a solar panel out in the fields. You know, so the the, the, the transitions will happen to where those are. Yeah, Winston, you know, the any any kind of technological um evolution is exciting to to certain cohort of society but when we're dealing with the reality of unemployment sitting at somewhere between 35 and 40 percent it creates anxiety in the minds so it's important that we have as a country a plan and that's the question that you've beautifully segged into is that i spoke earlier about the sector being a, a strong employer of people in south africa i mean the numbers are Amazing, 100,000 people at the factory level, 250,000 auto mechanics, another 250,000 taxi drivers or taxi owners, and 130,000 circa um, employed at petrol stations. Now, if I think about it from an investor perspective, if, if the future of kind of stock exchange listings would automotives be in an automotive category or in the tech category. And we're seeing some migration in telcos. From a risk side, we've experienced supply chain issues, battery shortages. Um, what about PGMs that go into EVs, right? So there's a whole ecosystem that one needs to think about and various people employed in these spaces. We do have serious challenges in our education system, particularly with maths and science, and that's what I spoke about STEM earlier. Winston, from your experience, you've been in it for more than a decade now. What should OEMs and educators in South Africa be enabling so that people can be upskilled, reskilled, and become part of, of this EV evolution? You know, um, again, I, I mentioned earlier that we that, that I was working in the education space in the beginning. And a big part of that was because I felt if we didn't educate people and, and and explain to them how this technology is advancing, then you know we'd we'd leave a whole generation behind because you you know we can't if we need engineers tomorrow and we don't have enough engineers coming through our system. 
I can't change that in one year. I need 10 years to change that because I've got to influence people at uh, grade five to start becoming, you know, engineering minded to become, you know, you, again, you don't teach someone in matric to, to get, be a maths person. You've got to be maths from grade one. <laughs> you know, you've got to, it's got to be something that is reinforced over and over and over. So, so it's something we've, the earlier we can start in that, in that education process for, for me is incredibly important. And in this, you know, things like maths, and I know it's standard at schools. And, you know, if I can put anything out there, maths is not nearly as daunting as what people think. The biggest fear in maths is the fear that other people put into your heads. You know, really, it's not, it's not as bad as what you might, you might believe. But it is going to be critical in nearly any job that you do in the future. You know, if you don't have that. So you've really got to make an effort to, to get into that and understand that. It is the fundamental language of future technologies. As we go forward in technology, the base language of that is mathematics. You know, in the same way that English is the base language in any other subject that you study. But for maths, you've really got to have those basics. So, so really getting, getting people interested in, the, in, in these things earlier at schools is incredibly important so that they would go through and be strong candidates for engineering type, um, you know, and science type topics in, um, at university and that they can go on into the, and form careers that are going to be based on these technologies. So really earlier is better without a doubt. STEM subjects and STEM, STEM driven projects, I think are great because they, they show people how the maths is applied. You know, I, I remember when we were still working with some of the schools, um, going into a school in Tembisa and putting a, 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 a vehicle down and showing the people you know, how you change the toe and camber on the wheels. And the, the kids were fascinated by it. And you could see, you know, the one kid said, no, this is what I want to do. I want to be a mechanic. I want to fix wheels. And, you know, so I showed him how the toe and the camber works. And once I'd shown it to him, I showed him how that maps into mathematics. And it had a complete change around for this kid to say, but maths is not just numbers. I'm not going to even be able to be a mechanic if I don't understand the maths properly, because that brings me to these, how the wheels are adjusted in the car and how that influences the performance of the vehicle, the fuel consumption, everything. And I think it's tying those things to practical examples that demystifies maths because people see maths as this mystery subject, you know, oh, it's, you know, oh, it's up there. It's not. It's practically on the ground. It's part of what you do every day. And, and as long as you understand that, then it's not as scary because it's not just academics that do it. In fact, you do maths all the time, you know, probably doing maths while you're walking. The fact that you can balance is your brain is doing maths. That's how you balance when you stand up. Now, it may become you think it's a reflex, but in real, in reality, internal to your body, there's maths happening. That's making a judgment that says, how much do I move forward, backwards? How do I keep balance? So, so these are fundamental things for us. Winston, I think you've kind of laid out some golden nuggets there. And the key is application. And, and hence our, our kind of focus on STEM. And how do you apply it so that it's practical? And when you see the practical application, then you get really excited about it. Exactly. And the... And the partnerships between higher education, basic education, industry now becomes super critical so that young learners from a young age can be exposed to these things. I mean, certainly for the current generation, irrespective of where you are in that spectrum, owning a vehicle, especially a high performance vehicle is an aspiration. Now, the more you engage with it, the more you can understand it and more you can contribute to its evolution. And so how do we create these, these pathways from both sides of the spectrum, from the educator side, but also the industry side? What are your thoughts on that? And what's your experience from the programs you've run? Sure. <laughs> um, I, I definitely think that working with industry helps hugely. Obviously, I came from the other side. So I, I had an industry problem. Where, where we were trying to get people to, to want to buy electric vehicles and there was a, a technological mystery. And, the, and, I, and I felt the way to solve that was to go back to the education side and teach people fundamentally what that's about. 
So kids are now coming out of school that have been exposed into STEM programs or programs like the solar car challenge that happened. Um, and those kids are coming out and they're already fully aware of this technology. I don't need to sell a thing to them. You know, they already know that is that is the future. So I think that the industry benefits hugely by influence, by, by providing that content in and showing how that's going to be applied. It'll also help to direct um, children. Um, I was at a school at one time and I, I just asked in general, I, I put out and I said, okay, you know, what type of jobs do you want to do? And I was quite amazed that about a third of the kids thought they were going to become rap, uh, rap singers. You know, now I've got nothing against rap in principle, but, you know, I think there were like three that said they would want to be engineers. Now, that was quite scary for me. And I think that's the wrong influences and, I, you know, that are getting them that, that the, that the perception is that it's easy to make money and sing, um, as opposed to saying we need engineers that build society and that grow things. You know, if we can influence people at an early stage that they start to feel like that, um, you know, they can take that message home to their parents and they can build that whole ethos of saying this societies are built on these sort of technologies and these sort of growth. So absolutely, industry should be pushing into the um, education systems. But I think equally, the education system mustn't sit there saying, we're waiting for industry to bring us, you know, some sort of golden nuggets. They've got to get out there and do it. I was listening on 702 yesterday and they, were, they, they nominated a teacher of the year or a teacher of the month, if I remember correctly. And if you can get that podcast, go and listen to this guy. It's incredible. You know, and and he had no industry back in him, but just his approach for saying this is how he approaches education and this is what he what he does and how he, and I think you know that's what it's about because if I'm looking for somebody to back, that's going to be the guy. <laughs> you know, I'm going to back the people that are that are driving from their side. So he's definitely saying it's got to come from both sides. We've got to see teachers that that will make it work and will look to drive in the practical interest in these things and driving those STEM subjects, but at the same time, they because they can then expose themselves to the um, to the technology. I've equally seen schools where we've gone in with great projects, but can't find a champion teacher or can't find teachers that are prepared to toe the line because industry is not going to stay in the school. You know, industry is going to come in, put the ideas down, maybe put some money into it, maybe put some product on the ground, but they need a champion and that champion has got to be a teacher. So if we're not seeing that in the in the education system, then it, it's harder to support it because you're going to put all of that in and nothing is going to come of it. You know, you're not going to see those children leverage that technology going forward. Thanks, Winston. I think it's going to need, like all things, a shared vision and a, a plan that's kind of co-created and, of course, passion to see this carry through over the long term because this entire transition as i said it's not going to happen overnight the automotive plan is to 2035 and then the move away from petrochemicals is 2050 so it's, it's quite a long time horizon so everyone can play a part i think and someone who did have in the industry the vision and the passion you know ages ago was henry ford and he said the remains of the old must be decently laid away, the path of the new prepared, that is a difference between revolution and progress. Winston, thank you very much for sharing your insights and your industry knowledge. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much. It really has been a pleasure. Thank, thank you for the time. I think we covered a whole lot of different angles, but I think these types of cross-functional conversations are quite important to take the industry, the sector forward. And particularly in a region like the Eastern Cape, I mean, automotive is core to economic growth and attracting the youth. And, and this is what we want to strive towards. So on that note, listeners, thank you so much for supporting our channel, for listening to our podcast today. Click subscribe to stay notified of the next episode. And until then, Remember to lift as you rise so that with purpose we can thrive. Thank you, take care and bye-bye.